My name is Neil de Burka and I'm delighted to join you for Easter Camp at the Galway City Museum. I'm a storyteller, which means I spend my life examining ancient tales and performing them for the public. I've been fascinated by mythical creatures since I was your age. Some of my favourites I'm going to talk about today and I'll also tell you a couple of stories. One of my all-time favourite mythical creatures is from a country at the other side of the world, Aotearoa, New Zealand. This beautiful country is also known as the land of the long white cloud and it's so far away it would take you nearly 30 hours to fly there in a jet plane. The Maori people of New Zealand have thousands of myths and legends of the gods and also their most famous mythological creature which is known as the Tanifa. The Tanifa lives in lonely places where there are mysterious currents or giant waves or in lonely river glades. The Tanifa, some say looks like a giant serpent or a cross between a lizard and perhaps even a whale. It can be the guardian, the kaiti aki, the guardian of the tribe. They must be respected and sometimes they can be malevolent. So you be very careful around the Tanifa. My favorite Tanifa legend is from the capital of New Zealand, Wellington. Wellington is a great harbour, but they say originally it was a lake, and in that lake were living two Tanifa. One was called Nake, and the other one was called Fataitai. Now, Nake was full of energy, and he heard stories from the birds about a mighty big ocean beyond the hills far from the lake. So he decided to burst out through the land into the ocean. He coiled up his tail and sprang forward one day and managed to burst through. His bestie, his BFF, Fataitai, also tried to do it, but Fataitai wasn't as strong and he got stuck on the mud between the lake and the sea. And he remains there to this very, very day in a place known as the Miramar Peninsula. And that's right here where you can see the picture of the whole of Wellington Harbour. You see in the middle there, the airport, where they say the Tanifa rests just beside it. I find it very interesting that the Maori word for the great white shark is known as the Mungo Tanifa. And some of the greatest great white sharks in the world can be found in Aotearoa, New Zealand. But that's for another day. On to our next mythical creature. Scandinavia has given the world many things, including Lego, good furniture, and the Vikings. One of my favorite things from Scandinavia are trolls. Originating in Norway, they say, trolls live in lonely places and often in family groups. They're not very smart, apparently, and if you can keep them talking, you can get away from them. But if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, they could eat you up. In many of the old stories, trolls are represented as being huge, grotesque creatures. And these days, often they're regarded as being small and cute. And in fact, sometimes they'll adopt and move in with a family. I've got a few trolls living with me here in my cottage. These guys actually come from Stavanger in Norway. And these fellows, they actually come from Estonia. They live inside my kitchen. Many people say that trolls are grotesque and full of bad habits, but I kind of like them. In fact, some people say they're a bit like myself. Now we go to Northwest Africa for our next mythological creature. The ancient storyteller said that somewhere in this region lay the garden of the Hesperides. And in this garden, there was an apple tree that bore golden apples. It belonged to Hera, the goddess, and it was protected by a beast called Ledon. It had 100 ferocious heads. Along came the Greek hero Heracles on his labors. One of his tasks was to steal some of the golden apples. And in one version, he fired an arrow that managed to kill the beast. When it died, when its blood seeped into the soil, from it grew trees. And those trees can be seen to this very day. Dragon trees. When you cut them, you can see the dragon's blood. Dragons are like the celebrity rock stars of the mythic creature world. Isn't it interesting how in the West, dragons are kind of regarded as ferocious, fire-breathing, serpent-like creatures that are going to pillage the village and bring harm and destruction. Yet over in East Asia, they're regarded as creatures of great fortune and majesty and, and power and nobility. It's a good thing to be born in the year of the dragon. 
Dragons are in most cultures around the world, and some folks say the reason why we can be scared of them is that they represent snakes and predators who used to come and get our ancient ancestors. Anyway, I'm about to tell you my favourite dragon story, and it comes from that cool country called Poland. This is about a dragon who wanted to eat some kids. Enjoy. That's Polish for mushrooms. Polish people love mushrooms. Every September, they get into the woods, pick as many as they can, take them home, they fry them, they roast them, they stew them. There was two kids living in Poland. One was called Krakas, and the other was called Piotr. Brothers. One day, their mother gave them two buckets and said, Kids, away you go to the forest and get as many mushrooms as you can. They were so excited. As they ran out the door, their mother said, But kids, remember, don't go too deep into the deep dark woods. There are dangerous creatures there. They might try and eat you up. Okay, Mama, said Krakus. What's the first thing they did? Straight into the deepest, darkest part of the woods. Oh, that's where the finest mushrooms were. They were right down by a river called the Vistula. And behind an oak tree, they came across some huge mushrooms. They were pulling them out of the ground and laughing and jumping around. Their buckets were full now. But what the boys didn't know is, not far from that tree was a cave. And in that cave was a huge big dragon. A dragon whose name was Schmock. Schmock the dragon. He was old when the world was young, and he was bad-tempered from throwing rocks into his lava-filled belly. He wanted something else to eat. And he heard the boys playing, picking mushrooms by the oak tree. He slithered out of his cave, climbed up, the top of the oak tree, along the branches, right over their heads. He looked down. They looked so tasty, the boys. The dragon opened his mouth, and a bit of dragon drool fell from his lips, straight down onto Krakus's head. <clears throat> Peter, did you just spit at my head? No. Something landed on my head. Ew! That's disgusting! It's not bird poop. And then they heard the dragon above them. Peter? Yeah? I think there's something over our head. I think you're right. Let's look. Ah! They looked up and they saw the dragon who flew up into the sky and he cast a beady eye upon the children. And he said, <laughs> time for breakfast. <laughs> he came flying down towards them. The kids, they ran for their lives. They screamed as they ran all the way away from the river Vistula, through the forest and all the way home. The dragon behind them coming through the trees. They arrived at their house just as the dragon landed behind them. <coughs> In they went and Mama slammed the door shut behind them. The dragon, he knocked on the door. <coughs> Duskal Mama and Doris. Mommy opened the door. <sniffs> Hello. How you doing? Who are you? My name is Schmuck and the local dragon. I saw two funny-looking creatures run into this house. What are they? What do you mean? What sort of creatures? Uh, this place is like a, it's like a train station. We get so many creatures coming through here every day, Mr. Dragon. All sorts of creatures. What were they like? They looked stupid. They looked silly. What do you mean? They didn't have scales on their bodies. They didn't have fur. They only had two legs instead of four. What sort of creatures are these? The only fur they had was on their heads, and it was standing up like this. Hmm, what noise were they making, sir? Well, it was kind of going, ah! What is these creatures? I think I want to eat one. Uh, they're called sheep. Sheep? Sheeps, yeah. Sir, this is actually a... I'm not a sir, I'm a dragon, okay? A sorry, dragon. What'd you say your name was again? Schmack. Now, what are these creatures? I want to eat one. Bring one to me. Um, Mr. Dragon, Schmuck, they're called sheeps, yeah. And this is a sheep-changing station. They look like the way you saw them first thing in the morning, two legs and, and no fur or wool on their bodies until this time. And then they come through this sheep-changing station and they run out the back in the form that they are for the rest of the day. They've got four legs, they've got lovely white wool, beautiful faces and lovely big ears. They're in the back field. There's a load of them there. You can take as many as you want. <laughs> See you, goodbye. She tried to shut the door, but the dragon, he stuck a claw in and he said, it don't work like that. I'm an old, old dragon. My scales itch. My lava's hurting my belly. 
here's what we're going to do, right? You're going to go and bring me one of them sheeps tomorrow. You're going to bring it down to my cave behind the oak tree near the river Vistula. In fact, you're going to bring me one of those sheeps every day and I'm going to eat it. And if you don't, I'm going to come up here. I'll eat your house up. I'll eat you up. You got what I'm saying? Okay. Bring me the first sheep in the morning. And then the dragon flew away. Dental share while yet. And when he was gone, Mama, she shut the door. She sat down at the table and held her head in her hands. And the two boys came up and, and Cracker said, Mama, you'll be okay. We know what to do. Daddy's got a musket. When he comes home from hunting, he'll get his musket. He'll go down and he'll say, Evil dragon, you shall die. And he'll shoot the dragon. It won't work, kids. Why not? With a musket gun, you only get one shot. And you never burst a dragon's skin with one shot from a musket. Dragons are too powerful. He'll eat your father, he'll eat all of us. And it was true. When Daddy came home, he said that what Mommy said was right. His gun would never hurt the dragon. But then Krakus spoke up again. Dad, Mom, Peter, I got an idea. <laughs> one shot won't hurt the dragon, but all the gunpowder at once will. What do you mean? Let's get Daddy's barrel of gunpowder, <laughs> and we'll wrap a sheepskin around it, and we get legs from the table, and we'll put them on the bottom of the barrel of gunpowder so it looks like a sheep's legs, and we'll paint a beautiful sheep's face on the front, and put little furry ears on it, and we'll take it down to the dragon's cave first thing in the morning, <laughs> and we'll put it outside, and when the dragon comes out, he'll think it's a sheep, and he'll eat it up, and when he eats the barrel of gunpowder, it goes into his tummy, and it meets the lava, the fire, and it goes BOOM! <laughs> No more dragon. Good idea? Nobody else could think of a better plan. So they got the barrel of gunpowder that was in the house. They got a sheepskin, wrapped it around the barrel, sewed it on nice and tight and snug. They got the legs off the table, cut them off, and then they put them on the bottom of the barrel and wrapped those in sheep's wool too. Then they painted a face at the front, just like a cute sheep, and put little woolly ears on. The next morning, before the sun came up, the family, carrying the barrel of gunpowder disguised as a sheep, went all the way down to the oak tree by the river Vistula, and behind it, they soon discovered the dragon's cave. They could hear him snoring inside. They placed the barrel of gunpowder outside. Then they climbed the oak tree, and Krakus called out. Dragon! Dragon, breakfast is ready! Wake up, dragon! The dragon opened his scaly eye. <laughs> and then he put his claw out of the cave. He picked up the barrel of gunpowder. He took it inside and he sniffed it. That smells nice. You know what I'm going to do? I think when I eat the sheep, <laughs> I might go back to that house and eat everything behind it and everything in it. <laughs> I'm hungry. The skull shit avail. He opened his mouth and he threw the barrel of gunpowder in, right past his teeth without chewing. The barrel rumbled and tumbled down to the dragon's tummy. The dragon sat back, yeah. But when the barrel of gunpowder got to his tummy, it met the lava and fire. And when fire meets gunpowder, you know what happens. It exploded and his belly went... <laughs> the dragon went, I think I got indigestion. Boo! The dragon flew out of the cave. Whoa! All the way over the tree in the forest. All the way away from Poland. All the way past Ireland. Across the sky. And it landed in the ocean far to the west. And there in the ocean, the dragon, Duskel he opened his mouth. He was so filled with terror and pain in his belly, he swam right to the bottom of the ocean, sucking in the water. And when he got to the bottom of the Atlantic, he scraped a hole out in the sand and jumped in and covered himself. He's never going to come out from that day to this day. You know why? He's absolutely terrified of sheeps. And the people, they wrote on their maps these words to show now where the dragon lives. They wrote these words, here be dragons. And you can see it on the old maps. 
As for Krakus, he was so smart when he grew up, you know what happened to him? He became the king of Poland, and he built his castle on Wawel Hill, just where that dragon's cave used to be the old days, near the oak tree. Around the castle grew a city. They say it's the most beautiful city in all of Poland, Krakow. And you can see a statue there to this very day of Schmock the dragon. And I think I know what that dragon's thinking. I got indigestion. It's always so much fun to share that story of Schmock the dragon. And I've had a great time with this video with you today, making it for you. Mythical creatures, why do they exist? Long, long ago, our ancestors sat around campfires and they tried to make sense of everything around them. I mean, the sound of thunder, the flashing of lightning, the twinkling of stars, why mountains were formed, or how rivers came to be. How did it all happen? The unknown. They made up stories to make sense of it. And at the heart of those stories, the most exciting parts were the beasts, were the mythical creatures and beings that the heroes, your ancestors, would engage with. And that's why we have stories to entertain and to educate. And it's been great talking to you. See you for the next video when we'll discuss Irish mythical creatures. Hello again. Ireland's ancient stories and sagas are filled with the most wondrous mythic creatures. One of my favorites is Cor the crane. This is what a crane would have looked like in ancient Ireland. Long, long ago, it was the third most popular pet in our country, after the dog and the cat. Unfortunately, this form of crane is extinct here now. It died out several hundred years ago. However, our ancestors passed us down stories of this crane in our mythology. And one of them concerns a young woman. Fado, Fado and Erin, long ago in Ireland, we ban in Shul Koshaliga. A woman was walking by the edge of the ocean. Her name was Aoife, Aoife the Fair. Walking beside her was a friend. Her name was Uhra. In fact, she was a pretend friend. You know one of those types who pretends, they, pretends they're a friend and they're not at all? This Uhra was filled with jealousy of Aoife because Aoife had won the heart of the mightiest warrior in the whole of the West Coast. His name was Ilvrak. They were due to be married but not if Ukra could help it. She was so filled with spite and jealousy, she had gone to a druid and purchased a Shladriatha, a magical wand that was fused with spells that would cause trouble for Aoife. As they walked by the ocean that day, the sun on their faces, Aoife saw a beautiful crane flying on the sea and she said, Fek, look! This was Ukra's chance. She whipped out the Shladriatha and she struck young Aoife on the arm. And she said, a crane you see, and as a crane you will be. And as soon as she cried those words, the poor arm of Aoife, it turned into a bird's wing, full of feathers. And then her whole body began to shapeshift. She took on the form of a crane. And as the poor young woman, in crane form, flew up into the air, wailing out in despair, her enemy, Ukra, cried out, And now you live the life of a crane for 200 years upon the sea you will be. And so it came to pass that poor Aoife, she never got to marry the mighty warrior Ilvrak. She had to spend her days on the western coast as a crane. The sea god, Manan and Maklur, although he could not change her back into her human form, he took pity on Aoife and tried to make her life as comfortable as possible upon the frothy waves. There was always fish for her to eat. And whenever possible, he would blow away the clouds so the sun could shine down on her. And often she would come to the shore and people would sit with her. When it came her time to die, the great sea god Manon and Maclure, he took her skin, the skin of the crane, and he turned it into his mola, his magic bag where he kept his treasures, his sacred belt made by the smith of the gods, his mighty sword that never knew defeat, and his golden helmet and his cloak of magical concealment. The years have passed. The god of the sea is no more, they say. 
It is said that Mananan McAleer himself died just north of Galway, and the spot where he died <coughs> from it burst forth a mighty lake, which we know today as Loch Carrob. But they say that if you go from Loch Carrob down the River Carrob, past the museum, and down by the swamp, and walk along Grattan Road, out Salt Hill, of a fine summer's day, when the sun is going down on the bay, if you look closely enough, when the tide is coming full, they say you can see the crane bag filled with the treasures of the sea god Manan and Maclure. They say you can see the sword, the cloak of concealment, the belt and the helmet. And then, as the tide ebbs away, the bag closes up and disappears. The shores of Galway are filled with wonders. When I was a young lad, I used to love going down to the River Corrib at Dangan. Between Dangan and Menlo Castle, I would swim whenever I could. That's about four kilometres up from the Galway City Museum. There I would come out of the water and often two black Labradors used to appear. I didn't know who they were, where they came from, but I would play with them for ages and then they'd just go off. So it's quite a magical place for me. Even now I go back there. So my mythological creature lives right there between Dangan and Menlo Castle. It's a powerful creature and its name is Awa. Awa's got a big long tail like an eel and it's smooth and flowing like the river. Awa, the tail goes all the way up to its waist and then its back is really powerful. It's got huge shoulders and in the shoulders are crevices and in the crevices over the ages grit has gathered and in among the grit seeds have fallen and the seeds have grown. They've grown into river weed. So Awa has got a big long cloak of green river weed. It even goes up over its head and it covers matted all over the head and down over the sides, down over the breasts. Awa, its belly is smooth, except it's got two sucker-like things here, like the mouth of a lamprey eel that can grab onto the bottom of the river when it's in flood. You know when the river carb gets really swift, especially after heavy rain? No problem to Awa. It just suckers onto the bottom of the river. It's got a big, happy mouth and its face it's all aligned. Its eyes are huge and bulbous. They stick out so Awa can look forward and back. Sometimes it looks forward and back at the same time. It can pick up prey easily. Loves delicious fish. <laughs> and also we can keep an eye out for enemies. Awa, he's got whiskers from his nose and from the eyebrows also. And these are like the whiskers of an otter. They also can pick up and sense things. It's magnificent, chameleon-like when it comes out of the water. It can actually rest by the side of the river on a summer's day. And when it's resting in the hot summer sun, as its skin hardens, it turns grey and Awa looks like a rock. People come walking by, they think there's a rock, they sit down, they eat their lunch, their friends sit down beside them, they're chatting, they're laughing. They get up and they walk away, come back the next day, no rock there. And people are shocked. They scratch their heads. Awa... Sometimes when the river is in flood, what it loves to do is it loves to let go and it tumbles and it plays. It's full of mischievous play and it goes down under the bridges, dancing in the bubbles and then out past the museum, out beyond Nemo's Pier and then with its powerful tail, all the way back up again and no one has any idea. People are looking over the bridges, looking down at the swirling water. Sometimes they'll get a glimpse, but not for long enough to identify Awa. I said that Awa is mischievous. Do you know what it's done through the centuries? It can't resist it. When people are crossing in boats, sometimes it'll reach up with its long fingers, big, long, bony-like fingers, black like the roots of a tree growing into the river. They'll come sliding over the side of the boat and it'll take things. Viking axes, bullets from Cromwellian soldiers, even spearheads from Celtic warriors, and ceremonial swords from Bronze Age priests of long ago. Awa has always been in the Carob and always will be. Perhaps one day, if you look long enough or your eyesight is sharp enough, 
you'll catch a glimpse of that mythical creature, Awa of the Karab. <laughs>